welcome to the session. My name's Simon Lloyd. Uh, I'm an ENT consultant in Manchester, and I'd like to talk to you today about the normal radiology of the temporal bone. And we're going to focus predominantly on the CT scans uh, of the temporal bone, but we'll also talk a little bit about the uh, MRI imaging. And uh, we're going to run through different aspects of the anatomy step by step. So we're going to start with the acicular chain. We'll then go on to look at the middle ear muscles and talk about some of the important structures within the middle ear, um, particularly the walls of the middle ear. And then we'll move on to the uh, vestibular apparatus and the cochlea and talk about the, uh, the anatomy of the facial nerve and talk about some of the more unusual um, things that you might not be quite so familiar with. So some of the fissures and um, channels within the, the uh, temporal bone, which uh, you, you might not see quite so often. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the anatomical variants that you might come across in your day-to-day -day practice that sometimes influences the, 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 uh, the way you manage patients. So we're going to start off with a, a run through of the ossicles. But before I do that, I wanted to talk briefly just about uh, the major compartments within the middle ear space. So you can divide the middle ear into three main areas, uh, the hypotympanum, the mesotympanum and the epitympanum. And those are really separated by um, the uh, anatomy of the external auditory canal. So. Um, anything above the level of the, of the uh, roof of the external auditory canal is regarded as the epitympanum. Anything below the floor of the external auditory canal is regarded as the hypotympanum. And anything between, which is essentially everything you would be able to see if the eardrum was removed, is the mesotympanum. And you can see that in this picture here. So highlighted in red is the epitympanum highlighted in green is the mesotympanum and in yellow is the hypotympanum and you can see the external auditory canal and the, its relationship to, to those areas and you can see the cochlea here and we'll talk in a lot more detail about the other structures around uh, around the ear as we go through so going on to the acicular chain um, i'm going to give you an overview initially and then we'll talk about the individual ossicles because there's elements of their anatomy that is quite important to note. Um, but I'm going to run through these axial CT scans step by step from the roof of the uh, middle ear space down to the floor of the middle ear space. And the malleus is marked in red, the incus is marked in blue, and the stapes is marked in green. So as we come down, you can see the internal auditory canal here. You can see the canal for the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve, and you can see the geniculate ganglion here. Uh, you can't quite see the, the horizontal portion of the facial nerve because we're just a slice or two too high, but what you can see here is the lateral semicircular canal and its ampulla, um, and obviously you can see the mastoid air cell system, which is very well pneumatized in this case. So just scrolling down, you can start to see the heads of the ossicles. Um, so both the head of the malleus and the body of the incus are situated in the epitympanum. And you can see here the he head of the malleus is anterior to the uh, incus. And as we come down, you start to see the typical, uh, what's called ice cream cone. So this is a really important um, uh, indicator of healthy uh, acicular um, chain and you can see the ice cream on the top which is the, the head of the malleus and you can see the cone which is the body of the incus and you're just starting to get the impression of the incus um, as it's inserted into the fossa incidus here so this is the short process the body of the incus and this is the fossa incidus here so as we come down further you start to see how the malleus and the incus um, separate. So here you're looking at the handle of the malleus and here you're looking at the long process of the incus. And again, it's really important to um, look for those two dots within the middle ear space because if one of them is absent, um, usually the incus, then that's an indicator of some erosion of the, uh, of the acicular chain. 
and we're just starting to see now the crura of the stapes so this is the vestibule here and uh, the uh, semicircular canals will be behind that the cochlea is just in front of that and you can see the footplate of the stapes here and just the base of the crura uh, anterior and posterior crura and um, just lateral to the footplate um, and you'll be able to see that a little bit more clearly as we come down a lot of the time on a CT scan the resolution isn't quite good enough for you to get a really good view of the of the stapes superstructure but um, sometimes you can see it pretty clearly and uh, uh, cone beam CT often can give you a, a, a clearer picture of the stapes than you would get on a, on a standard CT scan. So as we come down, the long process of the incus comes closer and closer to the head of the uh, stapes and you can see here how the uh, incus comes into contact with the head of the stapes at that point and you can still see the handle of the malleus uh, on, on this particular slice. Um, just coming down further and again you can see the rest of the handle of the malleus and you can kind of make out where the tympanic membrane would be. So quite often you can see the tympanic membrane and if there's some retraction of the tympanic membrane you often can see that on the CT scan. So let's just carry on down towards the hypotympanum and now we're looking at the coronal um, slices, so um, vertical slices through the head again on the CT scan and as we come from forwards to backwards you again start to see the acicular chain so just to give you your landmarks you can see here the cochlea um, this is the middle ear space here this is epitympanum this is mesotympanum you can't quite see the hypotympanum at this stage but it's kind of coming into view in this area here and this is the jugular bulb as it as it arches upwards and as we come back, you start to see the uh, acicular chain again, and you can actually make out the, the uh, malleus really nicely here. So you can see the head of the malleus, you can see the neck of the malleus, and then you just start to see the, the uh, lateral process of the malleus here. And as we come further back, again, you can see the lateral process of the malleus and the handle of the malleus and how that actually uh, interacts with the tympanic membrane at that point. And as we come further back still, um, you start to see the, the incus. Um, and there's some important structures on this slide. So the incus, again, predominantly within the epitympanum. And the long process of incus will come into view on the slides as we go further back, but you're just kind of starting to get the impression of it here. And you can see the uh, stapy superstructure just marked in green here. And if you look at the medial wall of the, of the middle ear at this point, you can see the lateral semicircular canal coming into view here. You can see the superior semicircular canal here, and you can see the vestibule at this point. You've also got a nice view of the internal auditory canal, and you can see the channel probably for um, the superior vestibular nerve and another channel um, here for the inferior vestibular nerve. The other structure, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on, um, which is very important, is this triangular area of bone here, which is called the scutum. And that's the area of bone that's often blunted when you're looking at CT scans of the patient that's got a cholesteatoma. And um, this area here between the incus, uh, well, actually, it's between the head of the malleus and the, and the scutum is Prusak space, which, again, we'll talk about later on. <clears throat> So as we come further back, you can just see the tip of this, the uh, short process of the incus here as it's inserted into the phospholyncidus, and then we come back towards the mastoid air cells, uh, which you can again see here really nicely. So if we go to the, uh, uh, the individual ossicles, we're gonna go through the same slices again, just to reinforce everything. So we're coming down, we're looking particularly at the malleus, um, and the head of the malleus is marked in red, uh, the neck of the malleus is marked in green, and the um, lateral process is marked in blue, and then the handle of the malleus is marked in yellow. So uh, again, starting at the top, you can see the top of the head of the malleus here, and as you come down, you start to get in towards the neck and the lateral process. So this is the, the lateral process of the malleus and then that's the neck of the malleus 
and then you come down and you can see how that becomes the handle of the malleus there and again the tympanic membrane will be in contact with that you can't see it very clearly on these scans and if we switch to the incus again you can see the long process of incus here and where it contacts the head of the stapes um, you can see the body of incus marked in red there again behind the scutum so you can't see that when you're looking at the tympanic membrane but you often can just see the shadow of the long process of incus and sometimes the stapy superstructure as well and as oh, and as we come um, back on to the um, axial scans you can again see the body of the incus marked in red the short process of the incus marked in green and you can see this ice cream cone that i mentioned before and then as we come down you can see the long process of the incus coming into view here with the two dots that I was mentioning before that um, if they're absent or if one of them's absent is an indicator of vesicular erosion. And then that long process of incus um, extends down towards the hypotympanum and the tip of the uh, long process of incus actually turns through 90 degrees and that's the, called the lenticular process. And that's the, the point at which there's the synovial joint between the, um, the tip of the long process of incus and the, and the head of the uh, stapes. Uh, so if we then move on to the stapes, <clears throat> what we've got here is the um, histological slice, um, again axial, through the uh, temporal bone and the corresponding radiological slice through the temporal bone and really beautifully demonstrated is the cochlea here you can see the uh, basal membrane and the scala vestibuli and scala tympani you can see the basal turn second turn apical turn and you can see the vestibule here and you can see the foot plate of the stapes and the arch of the stapes here so you've got the the anterior crust posterior crust oh, sorry and the head of the stapes here and then you've got the uh, long process of incus here. And the other structures that you can see are the cochlear nerve and the way that the cochlear nerves en enter the uh, modiolus. And you can see the uh, inferior vestibular nerve posteriorly here as well. Um, so going to the radiological slice, um, you can again make out those same structures, um, cochlear, internal canal, foot plate here can't quite make out the arch of the stapes um, but that's roughly where it would be situated and what's marked here is the um, fistula antifenestrum um, which is the area of the temporal bone that is most affected by otosclerosis so um, in an otosclerotic patient quite often on the ct scan what you see is an area of radiolucence in this area here, just anterior to the foot plate to the stapes. In milder cases, you don't always see that, but in, in a lot of cases you can, and that can really help you with the diagnosis of, of otosclerosis. So going to the anatomy of the stapes, um, again, we're gonna go through the slices stepwise from top to bottom. We're starting a little bit lower on these um, slices because obviously the stapes is lower down in the medial wall of the middle ear. Um, and we're just starting to see um, the structures now. So we've got the cochlea, the internal canal, the vestibule, and then the foot plate of the stapes is marked in pink. The anterior crust of the stapes is marked in yellow, and the posterior crust of the stapes is marked in green. And then you'll see as we come through the slices that the head of the stapes is marked in red. So uh, you can see here the foot plate quite nicely marked and the, and the base of the anterior and posterior crura. And as we come down, the two crura come together. You can just make out a sort of shadow of where the stapes might be at that point. They come together at the head and the uh, the head of the stapes is marked here in red where it's in contact with the um, lenticular process of the of the incus so um, we can pause here for some questions um, and if nobody's got any questions then we'll just carry on so uh, the next thing i wanted to talk about was some of the really important bits of anatomy in the walls of the middle ear space 
tasks. So um, one area that causes quite a lot of confusion, I think, when you're learning about the anatomy of the middle ear is the sinus tympani and the facial recess. And these two structures are in the posterior wall of the, uh, of the middle ear space. And they basically sit either side of the descending facial nerve. And I'll take you through again the, the axial slices of the temporal bone just to demonstrate those two structures. Uh, so hopefully you can understand their relationship to the facial nerve. So we're starting um, around the sort of uh, mid portion of the epitympanum. You can see the ice cream cone, malleus head, incus. You can see the internal auditory canal, vestibule, and the uh, top of the second turn of the cochlea here. You can see the mastoid air cell system. And you're kind of getting the impression of the lateral semicircular canal here. Um, and you can also see the horizontal facial nerve here. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. And as we come down, um, what you'll start to see is the horizontal facial nerve and where the horizontal facial nerve turns inferiorly uh, to become the descending facial nerve, you've got the, the um, um, second genu of the facial nerve. So you can just see that there. And as we come down further, you're starting to see the descending facial nerve. So this is the, the facial nerve here. And you've got this kind of triangular extension of bone here, which is called the pyramid. And that's the, the structure from which the um, stapedius muscle emanates. Um, and you can see the, the tendon of the stapedius muscle very clearly when you, when you do your um, stapedectomies. Um, and the two areas that we're focusing on now are the sinus tympani and the facial recess. So um, the area uh, that makes up the facial recess is this area just lateral to the facial nerve. And that's the area that you drill out when you're carrying out a cochlear implant in order to get to the round window and, and insert your cochlear implant. And in this case, because it's so well pneumatized, there's a lovely well pneumatized air cell pathway. Um, between the facial nerve and the and the posterior wall of the external auditory canal. Um, unfortunately, it's not always quite that well pneumatized, and it can sometimes be quite challenging carrying out that, that posterior tympanotomy, but um, this is a, a lovely, clear example. And then the area behind or, or medial to the, to the descending facial nerve is this air cell here, which is marked in red, and that's the sinus tympani. And that is a very variable structure. It can be very shallow, um, or it can be very deep, and this is kind of in the middle. And the reason why these two structures are important are because these two areas are key areas where cholesteatoma can be left behind, um, particularly in a case like this where there's a, a quite a deep recess. You can imagine once you've removed your cholesteatoma from the middle ear, you wouldn't necessarily check that area, and it would be quite easy to miss cholesteatoma, and that's when you need to get your endoscope out. Mm -hmm have a look with a 30 degree scope to check whether or not there's actually any residual cholesteatoma. It's not so difficult to um, clear the cholesteatoma from the posterior, from, from the facial recess, because you can relatively easily drill out that area um, when you're carrying out cholesteatoma surgery. So I'm just gonna continue down inferiorly. You can see again, uh, facial recess in front of the facial nerve, sinus tympani behind the facial nerve, and um, again, you can see actually it gets quite a bit deeper, that's, that, that sinus tympani there. So could, that'll be really challenging to clear cholesteatoma from. So let's just carry on down. Okay, so um, I'm gonna switch now to look at the muscles of the middle ear. And I'm sure you'll all be familiar with those. There are two main muscles, the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscle. Um, and uh, the function of those muscles isn't quite clear. I mean, a lot of people say that they're, they're there to protect the, the inner ear from excessive sound, but by the time the muscles have contracted, the, uh, the sound's already got into the inner ear, so uh, that probably isn't the reason why we've got them. Um, anyway, uh, we'll move on to the anatomy. Um, so with the tensor tympani, it's marked in red, and the stapedius muscle is marked in blue. Um, so if we scroll down again from top to bottom on the axial CT scans, um, I won't go through the landmarks because we've been through them again uh, before. Um, and what you'll see is 
the uh, horizontal facial nerve here, and we'll start to see the uh, the tensor tympani coming into view. Um, so this is the processus cochleariformis, which is a bony prominence on the medial wall of the um, middle ear, uh, which is uh, adjacent to the facial nerve canal, and that's quite an important landmark because it's quite constant and it tends not to be eroded by cholesteatoma, so it's quite a useful landmark for the facial nerve if you're faced with a very, very bland looking eroded um, middle ear when you're doing cholesteatoma surgery. Um, and the, the tensor tympani muscle um, does a 90 degree turn inside the, 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 the uh, processus cochleariformis. So um, the tendon of the tensor tympani is at 90 degrees to the muscle and the tendon itself inserts into the neck of the, of the malleus. So we're just starting to see the tip of the actual muscular portion of the muscle here. And as we come down to the next slice, you can see the tendon here and how that inserts into the, uh, the neck of the malleus. And as we come down further, you start to see the bulk of the muscle. There's a little channel here and the muscle itself is inserted into the walls of that channel. And that channel runs down in the uh, medial wall of the, uh, of the eustachian tube, just adjacent to the, uh, the carotid canal. Um, so you can see here uh, the, the muscles kind of bulking up as you come down into the canal. And as we come down further, you can see that the, the muscle is lying in the wall of the eustachian tube at that point. So I'm going to run you through the um, stapedius muscle now. Um, and uh, I mentioned before the pyramidal eminence. On these slices, the uh, pyramid is marked in yellow. And so as we come down, um, as I showed you before, you've got the descending facial nerve here. And then you've got the, uh, the, the pyramidal eminence here, which is the bony um, spur from which the tensor, the tendon of the stapedius muscle comes out. Um, so as we come down, we're just starting to see the, uh, the tendon of the, of the stapedius muscle at this point, and it inserts into the neck of the stapes, um, which you can just see the posterior cross of at this point. Um, and that's pretty much all you can see on this scan. So I'm just going to quickly run through the anatomy of the two uh, windows within the uh, inner ear. Um, they're uh, the two potential openings. Um, one, the oval window, is filled with the footplate of the stapes, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with. The second opening is the round window. Um, and the round window is situated inferior to the oval window, and it's filled with a, a membrane. And you, when you look into the middle ear, uh, down the ear canal, you can't actually see the round window itself because it's in a, a, a niche with a bony overhang over it. Um, and I'll show you the anatomy of, of those two structures now. So we're going to start just with the oval window. And on, on this axial slice, again, you can see the vestibule here and the footplate of the stapes. Um, and it's basically the space where the footplate of the stapes is sitting um, that makes up the, uh, the oval window. Um, so just moving on to the round window now, um, I mentioned a minute ago that there was a sort of bony overhang and a niche within which the round window is situated. And this is an axial slice a little bit below the level of the oval window. And you can see the cochlea here. So this is the basal turn of the cochlea. Uh, you can just see the second turn of the cochlea at this point. And this is the round window area here. So the fluid of the, of the cochlea is gray and air is black. And at that interface is where the round window membrane is situated. And as I mentioned, you can't see that membrane because you've got this bony overhang that's, um, that's just covering it. And you can see that more clearly on this uh, blown up slice. So again, the fluids of the cochlea here, this is the membrane itself, this is the air in the niche, and this is the bony overhang. Um, that covers the niche. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to some of the borders of the middle ear space now. So um, there are a couple of terms that are, are really important as we go through th this, and that's the tegmen um, and the uh, scutum. 
and I'll show you both of those structures. Um, so the tegmen, you can divide into the tegmen tympani, which is the, the bone separating the middle ear from the cranial cavity over the tympanic cavity. And then the te tegmen mastoidium, which is the, the sheet of bone that separates the mastoid air cells from the middle ear, uh, from the uh, intracranial cavity. So you can see here, marked in red, um, these are actually coronal slices through uh, the, the middle ear space. Um, you can see the thin bone that's separating the cranial cavity from the middle ear. You can see the heads of the ossicles um, and the air that's surrounding the heads of the ossicles. And on this slice, you can also see the scutum. So the scutum is that triangular area of bone that separates the epitympanum from the external auditory canal. And that's a really important structure because that's the area where uh, there's ero early erosion of bone when you're faced with a, a cholesteatoma. So what you see in a patient with a cholesteatoma is a blunting of this triangular area of bone here. So you'll, you'll have a sort of bony defect in this area and the cholesteatoma will be in, in this area here. So as we go back, um, you're starting to see some of, the, some of the other structures. So we've got the vestibule here. Um, you can see the facial nerve beautifully there, um, just underneath the lateral semicircular canal, um, which is horizontal on the coronal um, slices. And then you can see the vertical um, uh, pattern of the superior semicircular canal um, as we go backwards. And yeah. That's the uh, the coronal cuts through the uh, those structures. Um, I just wanted to just illustrate how the anatomy varies as well. So in that last um, image, you can see how the uh, tegmen is relatively high, and you've got good space between the the tegmen and the lat lateral semicircular canal. So you can see there's a pretty good distance between those structures. Um, but if you look at this scan, you can see that the uh, the tegmen is lower. So there's less distance between the lateral semicircular canal and the, and the tegmen. Um, and that is an important point to, to look for when you're assessing patients, when, it, when you're undertaking cholesteatoma surgery. Because if you're going to be doing a canal wall up procedure and you've got a very low lying middle cranial fossa, then access to the antrum and the middle ear can be very difficult through a posterior approach like that. And you might be best served to, to take a, a, an anterior front to back type approach. Um, and then going back to the scutum, you can see here again the scutum's marked and that space between the scutum and the malleus is called Prusak space. Um, and again, that's a, a, the typical area where cholesteatomas develop. Um, so you get retraction into that area and you see early soft tissue collection um, with keratin in this area here on the coronal CT scans of the, of, of the temporal bone. So Oh, excellent. Um, hi, Simon. Right, we've got some questions. Okay. Um, it's, please, can you repeat the slide of the round window? That was from Mohammed. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Um, so, guys, I know you're all asking me to, uh, Simon, to repeat slides. What I'm going to do is, if you don't mind, I'll just ask these bits. So, Simon, can you just redemonstrate the round window on that? Yeah. Sure, so this is an axial slice and you can see the basal turn of the cochlea here. This is the middle ear space. You can see the malleus handle here and just the tip of the, of the long process of incus here uh, and the facial nerve here. This is the sinus tympani and the facial recess here. And you can see the uh, posterior extent of the basal turn is marked by this, this cutoff between the basal turn here, which is fluid filled, and the air filled recess of the round window niche. Um, and the membrane is actually this area separating the two. So that little pocket of air is, is, is the air within the bony overhang of the round window niche. And then we've got another couple of questions and take them in the order that you feel best. One mm -hmm. is um, in terms of terminology, what is the difference between the vestibule and yeah. the mastoid antrum? And then the next question is about the semicircular canals on the axial view okay. and about Prusak's uh, 
and again Prusak space because I think that's an important concept. Yeah sure so the difference between the vestibule um, and the mastoid antrum but the vestibule is actually within the labyrinth so um, it's the sort of uh, dilated area that the semicircular canals open into and it contains the utricle and the saccule uh, which measure acceleration in different directions so um, that's that's the vestibule the mastoid antrum is obviously the air filled space separating the mastoid air cells themselves from the middle ear space um, is that is that clear yeah, that's great. And then um, can we just explain um, Prusak's uh, space, please. Yeah, sure. So I'll take you back to the, the coronals again. So, oh, um, and semicircular, yeah, and the, semi, and the canals, please. Well, we'll go on to the semicircular canals in a bit, actually. I've got some slides specifically about those, so I'll, I'll run through those later on. Um, with with Prusak's space, it's basically the space between the scutum and the malleus head. So this, again, is a coronal CT. So um, you can see the tympanic membrane here, you can see the handle of the malleus here, and that's the head of the malleus here, facial nerve and lateral canal. And this is the external auditory canal here. And this is the, this is the scutum, that triangle of bone that, that separates the ear canal from the epitympanum. And Prusak's space is that space between the scutum and the malleus, at the head of the malleus. So it's this space here, okay? So when you're looking in a patient, if you do otoscopy, you'll see the lateral process of the malleus. And then between the lateral process of the malleus and the scutum, there's, there's a little bit of retraction often where the pars flaccida is. And, and the, if, if that retraction develops further, it develops into Prusak space, that space between the scutum and the head of the malleus. Is that, is that clear? Thank you, Simon. Yeah, I think if we move on. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the vessels now. So, and um, there's obviously two main vessels within the temporal bone. The first is the internal carotid artery, and the second is the jugular bulb and the jugular vein and the sigmoid sinus, so that venous um, system. Um, so, I'll, I'll take you through those two structures. So, um, again, we've got axial slices through the, through the uh, temporal bone. And we're starting superiorly and working our way inferiorly. So you can see the cochlea here. You can see the internal auditory meatus. And you can see the vestibule here, middle ear space, and then the mastoid here. And the, the, the venous system is marked in blue. So we can just see the apex of the jugular bulb um, at this point. So if you en envisage the sigmoid sinus, that that comes from the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus runs inferiorly and anteriorly down towards the skull base and then it kind of turns superiorly again and forms a sort of bulb um, and then that then passes inferiorly and becomes the internal jugular vein. Um, so if I just scroll through uh, and as we go down I'll go through the structure so you can see the bulb starting to come into view you can also make out the sigmoid sinus here. So the sigmoid sinus will be running obliquely through the bone and then it developed into, this, into the jugular bulb. Um, and then as we come down, the bulb gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We're getting to the point now where we're just below the cochlea. So that's the basal turn of the cochlea. Um, and you can see how this is really in the hypotympanic area. Um, and then as we come down further, you can see the two parts of the jugular uh, foramen. So the jugular bulb fills the, the um, pars venosa of the jugular foramen, um, which is the more posterior part of the, of the jugular foramen. And then the, the, the bulk of the nerves that come through the jugular foramen are more anterior in the pars uh, nervosa. So you can see here marked in light blue, the pars nervosa just in front of the pars venosa behind it. Okay, and as we come further down, you can see how those two structures merge into one uh, jugular foramen. Okay, um, and then if I just take you back up to the top, I'll take you through the the uh, the, the arterial anatomy. So, the internal carotid artery 
it has quite a complicated core. So it comes up through the neck and vertically and then enters through the, um, the uh, foramen and carotid canal in, into the carotid canal. And then it turns posteriorly and then it turns again, uh, sorry, turns anteriorly and then it turns again and runs superiorly um, into the circle of Willis. And uh, the artery is basically in the medial wall of the uh, eustachian tube. So you can see here the eustachian tube orifice coming into view here. And as we come superiorly, you just start to see the internal carotid artery here, just anterior to the cochlea. And you can see the muscle of the um, of the tensor tympani here, which is in close proximity to the artery. Um, and it's a it's a very easy structure to see on the CT scan. It's a pretty big um, vessel, and you can see how it passes um, anteriorly, and eventually you probably won't see it on these slices, but it it turns superiorly into the cranial cavity. And you can see here there's a, a little bridge of bone between the vein and the artery and that's called the crotico um, jugular notch um, which is like a sort of triangle triangular spicular bone between the two okay um, mostly the arterial anatomy is pretty steady um, you just have to be a little bit cautious about um, aberrant carotid arteries um, you can mistake aberrant carotid arteries for middle ear tumours, particularly glomus tumours, and you don't want to be removing an aberrant carotid artery, that will give you a nasty shock. Um, so it's very important to check the, uh, uh, the anatomy of the, of the carotid artery if you're, if you're looking at a, a potential middle ear tumour. And you can see on this um, coronal slice through the temporal bones that uh, there's a, an aberrant carotid artery here, um, which is basically sitting inside the middle ear space. Um, and that will be a pulsatile mass that you'll be able to see behind the tympanic membrane. Um, but the venous anatomy is actually very variable. The height of the jugular bulb varies enormously. The size of the sigmoid sinus um, varies enormously. Um, so you just have to bear that in mind when you're interpreting things. And this, these slides just again show you um, uh, some of the axial slices through an aberrant carotid artery, internal carotid artery. So you've got a fairly normal looking um, internal carotid artery here, but there's this large branch going through the middle ear space, which you can see very nicely here, which, uh, which is the, the structure you want to avoid biopsying. Um, and there are variations in the jugular bulb as well. I mean, this is a, a, a rare case of a dehiscent um, jugular bulb. I've seen a couple of these cases and they can take you by surprise when you're doing a tympanoplasty because you raise your tympanomiatal flap and you're faced then with a with a, a dehiscent jugular bulb, and you can easily damage that. And uh, this, this is one case in point where the jugular bulb was damaged, and you can see the pack that was placed within the ear canal here to stop the bleeding from the internal um, uh, jugular vein at that point. So again, if you've got scans when you're doing a tympanoplasty, just check that out. It's extremely rare. Uh, I don't want you to worry that you're going to come across that in every case you're doing, but. Um, but uh, it's just something to bear in mind. And similarly, when you're doing mastoid surgery, um, particularly canal wall up surgery, you need to just have a look at the anatomy of the sigmoid sinus. And you can see here on this axial scan, lateral canal, middle ear space, mastoid air cells, um, but you've got this diverticulum from the sigmoid sinus that basically means that you can't get access posteriorly from um, from the cortex of the temporal bone into the middle ear. Um, so again, you'd have to take a cholesteatoma out front to back rather than back to front in, in a situation like that. And this is a high jugular bulb. So the, the jugular bulb normally doesn't really go as high as the internal auditory meatus, but there are unusual cases where the bulb can go right up to the middle cranial fossa. So um, you can see here, this is a, a, a coronal slice through the, the temporal bone and the jugular bulb's going right up into the top. And that, that's a real challenge if you're going to carry out, a, for example, a translab case, you have real difficulty getting access into the, into the deeper part of the temporal bone um, in that situation. Okay, so 
Um, but those are the venous and arterial structures within the temporal bone. I'm just going to go through some slices relating to the facial nerve now. And again, I've got a histological. Simon, yeah. Sorry, come again. Just one question on the vessels. Yeah. Um, James Constable actually asked me directly, uh, yeah. and I have no idea. Um, in what otology procedures are the petrosal sinuses relevant? Uh, for your information, James, I hate ears. There we go. Right. <laughs> so. so there's yeah. a couple of there's a couple of sinus petrosal sinuses the superior and the inferior sinus. Um, the, you don't usually come across them when you're doing middle ear surgery. To be honest, um, where we come across the superior petrosal sinus the most is in skull base surgery if you're doing a trans lab, and uh, it it's not a structure that you need to be overly worried about. But if you make a hole in it with your drill, it's a pain in the neck to stop the bleeding. Um, and that, that superior petrosal sinus runs in the ridge along the top of the temporal bone. Um, so it's in the sort of um, sinodural angle. Um, so that, that, that's something that we do see from time to time. Um, with the inferior petrosal sinus, that's something that you don't see very often at all. And there's, there's often more than one, there's two or three, and they enter the, um, the venous uh, or the, the major venous system at the jugular bulb. Um, so the only time we really encounter those is if we're doing um, an infratemporal fossa approach for a, a jugular paraganglioma and you only see it when you open up the jugular bulb. Um, and those inferior petrosal sinus branches, they run through the, the jugular foramen um, and they're, they're sort of running between the nerves um, within the pars nervosa into the jugular bulb. So um, you can't actually ligate those branches you actually have to plug them off when you're doing a jugular um, paraganglioma case does that does that answer the question that's okay. great simon thank you yeah. okay um so uh, i'm going to move on now to the anatomy of the facial nerve so you can see again an axial slice a histological slice here so You've got the the cochlear nerve here, uh, sorry the 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 um, facial nerve here in the IAM, um, and you can see it's a relatively uh, wide nerve at that point. And then as you come laterally, the nerve becomes very thin as it goes into the uh, interlabyrinthine portion, and it turns anteriorly. So this is the this is the point where it gets pinched when you get uh, a, a, an idiopathic facial palsy. Um, and then that very narrow labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve goes into the geniculate ganglion here. And then the nerve turns acutely posteriorly and runs in the wall, medial wall of the middle ear as the horizontal facial nerve and then turns at the second genu here um, to run as the, as the descending portion of the facial nerve. And you can see here the uh, superior vestibular nerve here going to the vestibule. Okay, and if you take the radiological view of that, again, it's an axial slice through the, through the temporal bone. You've got the IAM, you've got the vestibule here, the lateral semicircular canal here, and you can see how the facial nerve enters the um, facial nerve canal here, the labyrinthine portion, and it joins the geniculate gang ganglion or forms the geniculate ganglion and then turns posteriorly to run in the medial wall of the middle ear. And it's at this point that the, um, the uh, the uh, inferior um, petrosal nerve exits the sorry the superior petrosal nerve exits the uh, the geniculate ganglion. Okay, so I'll just take you through the axial slices of the facial nerve. Um, so, in, marked in blue on that slice, you can see the geniculate ganglion. Um, you can see the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve here, that very narrow section that I mentioned, and the uh, intracanalicular portion of the facial nerve you can't actually see it on a CT scan but it's been marked in in yellow there just for illustrative purposes and then as we come down the important thing to note is the close proximity of the horizontal facial nerve with the lateral semicircular canal so you can see the lateral canal here that's the vestibule um, and as we come down you can see how the horizontal facial nerve runs posteriorly in the medial wall of the of the middle ear just underneath the um, lateral semicircular canal. So that's the horizontal nerve. And then we're getting towards the point where 
it turns inferiorly to run down through the uh, mastoid air cells and through the stylomastoid frame and into the carotid gland. Um, so I'm just following that down. And just to join that up with what we were saying earlier on, you can see the pyramidal process here where the stapes exits, uh, the stapedius muscle exits. This is the sinus tympani that we were looking at before. And this is the facial recess that we looked at before. Okay, and as we come down, you can see how the facial nerve canal widens as it as it exits through the stylomastoid foramen. Um, just to show you the uh, coronal slices, and um, just to illustrate how the facial nerve relates to the lateral semicircular canal. So this is the lateral semicircular canal in the coronal plane. This is the superior semicircular canal here, and that's the vestibule. And you can see how the lateral semicircular canal is horizontal here, and then just hanging off underneath that um, is the is the facial nerve canal here, and that's the malleus, um, the head of the malleus. So the facial nerve is just medial to the, the the head of the malleus there. And then looking further anteriorly, if you look again, look at the coronal cuts, you can see these two sort of cat's eyes, which is where the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve is turning anteriorly and into the geniculate ganglion and then the geniculate ganglion is turning posteriorly into the horizontal canal uh, horizontal portion of the facial nerve so this is the the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve and this is the horizontal portion of the facial nerve here okay and yeah Again, these are the, just the coronal cuts, so you can see the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve. And as you, as you come forward, you can see how it becomes the group of geniculate ganglion and then turns into the horizontal facial nerve there. And then, and then it runs in the uh, descending canal through the stylomastoid frame, and which becomes much wider as it exits. Okay, any questions about that? So, Simon, I know it's, uh, the only um, question was on the vascular thing, which actually might do at a later date, was um, Eric has asked if the carotid or jugular was accidentally injured or indeed, I suppose, going towards the facial nerve during a mastoidectomy, what would you, what mm. would you do with vascular injury? I think we might do a session later on about complications. Or would you yeah, like to do a session? It's quite a long quite a long answer to that. I mean, I guess if you, if you damage a vein, the, the, the first thing is not to panic because it's a low pressure system. Um, uh, historically, people have said you should put the head down. We tend not to do that, to be honest. Um, it's very unlikely if you've got flow through the, the vein that you're gonna get air sucked into the venous system. And then pressure, if you put pressure on the vein um, and leave it long enough, usually it clots so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you've made a big hole, then you can use um, uh, Surgicel, which is just a procoagulant, or Flow Seal, uh, which again is a, a procoagulant. Or if it's a really big hole, you can actually um, stitch a kind of roll of Surgicel over the over the hole that you've made. Um, if you if you damage the artery, then you're in trouble. Um, you have to abandon the surgery, uh, pack the ear, and you need to get your interventional radiologist involved with that one. Um, thankfully that doesn't happen very often Thank, thanks simon oh and actually one more question uh, how to identify dehiscence in the facial nerve canal uh sometimes it's difficult um the best way is just to give it a poke um just gently um but that will tell you whether it's dehiscent or not um you, you sometimes can't tell because it's covered in mucosa and the mucosa looks pretty similar whether there's bone over it or not so um yeah, just 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 gently feel whether or not there's dehiscence there. I think that's the, the main thing. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so I'm just going to quickly take you through the cochlea. We're kind of running a little behind, um, but again, we're on axial slices of the temporal bone here, and we're starting at the top. So you've seen this slice before. This is the internal auditory canal, vestibule, lateral semicircular canal. This is the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve and the geniculate ganglion here. And you're just starting to see the top of the um, cochlea just here. So you can see how close the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve is to the, to the cochlea at this point. And as we come down, 
you can see this is actually the second turn of the cochlea um, because of the kind of a, a bleak um, angle of the of the cochlea. You're starting now to see the apical turn of the cochlea here. Um, and you can see the cochlear canaliculus, which is the bony defect through which the cochlear nerve travels into the modiolus. And then as we come down, um, we're starting to see the basal turn. So again, when, when you think back to the round window um, slices that we looked at earlier, you can see the basal turn here. And this is the round window niche with that little pocket of air and the bony overhang um, just here. Um, so you can see that more clearly on those slices. Okay. And then if you look at an MRI, we're going to look at MRIs in a bit more detail in a short while, but um, with this is a T2 um, axial slice through the cochlea and with a good quality scan, particularly with the, with the 3T scans that we've got now, you can see the com compartments of the cochlea. So you can see the basilar membrane here and you can see the scala vestibuli marked in yellow and the scala tympani marked in red on, on that MRI scan. Okay, so um, just moving on to the, uh, the, the vestibular apparatus. Again, we're starting at the top um, and it, the, um, the superior semicircular canal obviously arches superiorly um, with the apex of the arch just below the tegmen. Um, so on an axial slice, which is what we're looking at here, I think, yeah, um, you can see the cat size of the um, superior semicircular canal. So you've got the anterior cross here and the posterior cross here. Uh, and as we come inferiorly, um, you start to get to the posterior um, canal here. That's on the axial slices, just uh, a, a sort of um, thin um, cross section that joins the common cross um, here. So that's where the superior canal and the posterior canal meet. And then as we come further down, we start to see the ampulla of the superior canal and then the lateral canal here. So um, you can see the arch of the lateral semicircular canal very nicely there. And then that's the vestibule. So all roots meet in the vestibule when it comes to the semicircular canals. Um, there, are, there are five entry points um, from the semicircular canals into the vestibule. And there's only five because of the common cross. Um, the, the posterior and the superior canals, they join together. So there's, only, there's one less entry point than you might expect. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Um, no, no, no direct question, Simon. Um, the only thing is to take, take, your, take the time you need. I think everyone's enjoying the teaching, so uh, we can extend sessions if needed for the speakers. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it for the time being. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the channels that you might see in the temporal bow now. It's getting a bit more obscure, but I think it's important just to be aware of them because sometimes these can be mistaken for fractures when you're looking at temporal bone fractures um, and some of the structures you'll you'll be well aware of and you'll probably be familiar with the um, the arcua artery which is the artery that passes through the, the superior um, canal or between the crua of the semicircular canal because you'll see that when you do temporal bone dissections and you can see that on the scans so um, again, we're looking at axial slices through the CT, uh, through the temporal bone. You can see the two cat eyes of the superior semicircular canal, and you can see the, the vessels, the, the arcuate artery running um, in its canal um, through the, 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 uh, the arch of the superior semicircular canal there. Okay, so that's called the petromastoid canal. You don't need to worry too much about that. And then the other structure that's important is the, um, the vestibular aqueduct. Um, and it's actually um, quite difficult to see the vestibular aqueduct in a normal patient. Um, you can see here where the vestibular aqueduct is starting and the, the um, uh, endolymphatic sac will be in the dura at this point here. So you can see a sort of depression in the bone at this point. 
And then from the endolymphatic sac, the endolymphatic duct or the vestibular aqueduct, it's the same, same structure, just a different name, um, runs through the bone and it should be thinner than the diameter of the posterior semicircular canal. Um, so uh, I'll just show you the, well, it doesn't matter which canal, they're all pretty much the same diameter. So that's the, the lateral semicircular canal here. And you can see how the, um, the vestibular aqueduct is running in the bone here and it's thinner than the, the diameter of the lateral canal. And th that's important for patients that have widened vestibular aqueduct syndrome. It's, a, it's the best measure or the easiest measure you can use for assessing whether or not it's abnormally wide or not. Okay. Um, so, um, so I'm just going to take you through some of the nerves now and the channels in, in the bone that the nerves run through. So um, you've seen the petromastoid fissure here. That's the superior semicircular canal like you saw before. And if we get to the IAM, so again, you can see the IAM coming into view here. That's the lateral semicircular canal. And you can see a canal here for the, for the labyrinthine portion of the facial nerve. But there's also a little channel here, um, which is uh, the termination of the superior vestibular nerve um, or the ampullary nerve. Um, so this is the, uh, the vestibule and the ampulla of the superior semicircular canal. And then as we come down, um, you also see another little channel for one of the terminal branches of the inferior vestibular nerve, which is called the cingular nerve. Um, and that, that runs to the posterior uh, canal ampulla there, which you can see quite nicely. Okay, so they're fairly subtle um, things, but it's worth bearing in mind that those channels are there, particularly when you're looking for, for fractures of the temporal bone. Okay. Any questions about that? No, no, Simon, there's no, um, oh, actually, so just one, um, what is the value of imaging the scala tympani and vestibule? Uh, well, for the majority of cases, it, it, there isn't really any major advantage. Um, I think that there's two situations where it is helpful, um, one a little bit more experimental than the other. Um, the most common reason why we want to know whether or not the, the scala vestibuli or the scala tympani are patent is in meningitic cases that we're considering for cochlear implantation. So normally we place the cochlear implant electrode in the scala tympani, which is the, er the area of the cochlea you access through the round window. But if you've got a, a child, for example, that's had meningitis, the scala tympani is the first area that gets obliterated within the cochlea. Um, so we may need to look at implanting the scala vestibuli, which um, is accessed just superior to the scala uh, tympani. So you have to take out the stapes and um, drill out the scala um, vestibuli. Um, the other area where it might be helpful and I, I guess might come into more um, open use clinically in the long run, um, is looking at whether or not there's endolymphatic hydrox. Um, so if you've got um, really high quality imaging um, and you do the right sequences, you can actually image the compartments of the, of the cochlea and you can see the hydrox, the expanded um, endolymphatic compartment of the, of the cochlea. So those, those are the two main reasons why you might want to look at those, those particularly. Thanks, Simon. Okay, so I'm just going to move on now to MRI imaging, and it's not, not um, going to take too long to go through this. A lot of you will be fairly familiar with the structures um, from looking at scans from acoustic neuromas and that sort of thing. But the first, the first scans I'm going to show you are probably ones that you're not all that familiar with, and that's the, the sagittal plane um, through the IAM and the only reason to do that really is just to show you the the, the nerves within the IAM because you can see them beautifully on these slices. So this is a vertical cut, um, not quite through the midline but just off the midline and we're just going to scan through um, those sort of sagittal or, or oblique coronal cuts. So you can see the IAM here, um, this is cerebellum here 
This is the skull base here. Um, and this is the IAM, it's a T2 rated scan. So the CSF is white. And you can see the four nerves within the internal auditory canal there. So um, at the front, superiorly, um, you've got the cochlear nerve. And then underneath that, you've got the facial nerve. Um, and then the, uh, behind that, you've got the two vestibular nerves. So you've got the superior vestibular nerve and the inferior vestibular nerve. Okay, so th the way that you can remember that is coke up, seven down, and um, sorry, sorry, se seven up, sorry, I should say facial nerve up, uh, cochlear down, my, my mistake. Um, and then obviously the superior and inferior vestibular nerves are easier to, to remember. They're in the posterior compartment of the internal auditory canal. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll move on now to the axial cuts on the MRI, which I think you'll probably be much more familiar with. And again, I'm going to use T2 weighted imaging because you can see the structures of the inner ear much, much more clearly on the T2 weighted imaging. So with T2 weighted imaging, water or CSF is is white. Um, you can see the brain stem here, you can see the cerebellum here, and you can see the fourth ventricle here. Um, this is the opening of the fourth ventricle into, this, into the cerebellopontine angle, that's called the foramen of Lushka, and the um, cochlear nucleus would be situated just here within the brain stem, but we're not going to show you that today. Um, and if we move down, we're just starting to see the internal auditory meatus here. So the bone is black um, and the canal is white because it's full of CSF. You can see the cochlea here and you can see beautifully the um, basilar membrane or the, or the or, yeah, the, the, and the two scala um, of, the, of the cochlea. And then that's the vestibule within the um, um, vestibular apparatus. And you can see the nerves um, within the internal auditory canal there. So if I just scroll through, you can see from the brain stem, two main nerves. You can see the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is the more posterior one and the, and the much wider one. Um, and then just anterior to that is the facial nerve. So the facial nerve's red, the vestibular cochlear nerve's in blue. Um, and you can see as you pass across the IAM, the two nerves, again, the slightly smaller facial nerve anteriorly and the slightly larger vestibular cochlear nerve posteriorly, both passing into the internal trumiatus. And you can see how um, the vestibular cochlear nerve splits into two. So you've got the, the cochlear branch here and then the vestibular branch here. And then you've got the facial nerve superiorly, um, which goes through the labyrinthine portion into the geniculate ganglion there. Okay, uh, so, and then if you scroll down further, you start to get into the, to the other cranial nerves. So if we start at the top, um, you've got the trigeminal nerve, which is superior to the, um, to the vestibular cochlear nerve and the facial nerve, and that runs um, horizontally across the cerebellopontine angle from the pons into uh, Meckel's cave. And that's marked in green. Um, and then if we come down a little bit, you can just see the abducens nerve here. That's a very small nerve. It's quite difficult to see, um, particularly because it's sort of cut, cut obliquely on this slice, on these slices. And then as we come down inferiorly, you start to see the, uh, the lower cranial nerve. So that's the uh, vagus nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, and the spinal accessory nerve just running across the inferior part of the cerebellopontine angle. And then as we come down further, you start to see the hypoglossal nerve, which comes, comes out of the brainstem lower down and passes into its own separate canal. Okay, I think that's it.